great joy to be to be here and uh, it's always very beautiful to meditate god's word you know when uh, when the disciples who were walking towards uh, emmaus at the end of the journey this is what they said you know were not our hearts burning when he spoke with us so every time we meditate on the word of god and every time we learn, we, we read the bible i think it really burns within us and uh, even peter himself acknowledged to jesus this you know to whom will we go lord you have the words of life uh, it's been it's been you know i really consider this as a privilege i thank god for this opportunity and i also thank uh, uh, thank all the sponsors and i think it's been an amazing journey especially with open up uh, i have attended a few sessions and i have seen you know the way we meditate every every evening every evening the way we meditate you know bible transforms us bible and um, not just comforts us but it transforms our life and uh, there are many people who have tried uh, to destroy bible you know many people have tried to burn it down many people have tried to abolish but over all the years how much ever people have tried uh, they haven't succeeded and succeeded in that the only thing that has happened is this uh, the bible has grown more and more and i just want to start today's meditation with this beautiful illustration uh voltaire a french philosopher who lived during the 15th 16th century he once said like this 100 years from my death the bible will become a museum piece and uh, 100 years after his death the french bible society uh, bought his home and uh, set the french bible society headquarters right there and there they started uh, printing the printing uh, bibles in french so i think how much ever people try one thing is for sure Uh, whatever god has decided whatever god has planned it will come to pass let me uh, jump straight into uh, today's uh, today's meditation i want to start off with these three uh, with these three very beautiful verses second uh, timothy second timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 all scripture is god breath and it is useful for teaching rebuking correcting training and righteousness so that the servant of god may be thoroughly equipped for good work you know one of the main reasons why this subject was brought forth to open up is this so that we will know we will understand the value of the bible and we will we will uh, we will be more interested you know for many for many of us bible has become like a custom it has become like a tradition but it is more than that it is god speaking to man somebody said like this the bible is the only book whose author is always present uh, when it is read how amazing it is the bible is the only book whose author is always present when it is read you know it is god breath it is god breath uh, romans uh, chapter 15 and verse 4 says like this for everything that was written in the past was written for our instruction every word in the bible every full stop every but every so every comma is written for our instruction so that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope that's amazing you know the bible uh, gives us hope in a world where we do not know in certain in an in an uncertain world when you do not know what is going to happen uh, it says the bible gives us hope and it is written for our instruction and uh, before i uh, jump into the crux of our today's study uh, this is the final verse that i want to read second peter chapter 1 and verse 21 it says like this for such prophecy was a was for no such prophecy was ever brought about through human initiative but men spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit the bible was not a thing that was written by man as many people think you know many people see uh, this was this is an this is a old book this has nothing to do with the 2020 but this was a book that was that men wrote as they were carried along by the holy spirit you know that is why when we meditate upon the writing of the bible we 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 we, we, we come across two things one is the style of the author another one is the inspiration of god inspiration of god plus style of the author is what we we can see all throughout the bible so uh, so this this particular teaching series is going to be in two parts one is going to be uh, today that is we are going to complete and completely see the old, uh, the part of the old testament and uh, might be in the next week or some other time we will have the new testament part so today i'm just going to concentrate on the old testament part so i have divided this entire old testament uh, how we got the bible how we got the old testament into four parts so let me go uh, one by one let me go one by one so number one the first part is this languages of the bible uh, in what language was bible written or was it written primarily in english or tamil or uh, or malayalam or telugu what were the languages of uh, what were the languages of the bible 
uh, Bible was written primarily in three languages. One is Hebrew. Number one, Bible was written in Hebrew. Number two is Aramaic. Number two is Aramaic. Number three is Greek. So these were the three primary languages that the Bible um, Bible was written. So even as I speak, if there are any doubts, you can actually always you can note it down and you can send it to the host uh, that I can answer it when when I come to the next session. So these were the three primary languages that the Bible was written. And there is this beautiful thing uh, about the Bible. They say, you know, it was written in three languages from three different continents or by 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years. Yet it has the same flow. Yet it has the same message. Yet it, 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 is, it, it is so beautiful. There is no lapse anywhere. So these are the three languages in which the Bible was written. So let me go one by one. Number one. The first language that uh, the Bible was written, it was written in Hebrew. So number one, Hebrew, it's a dialect of Canaan. Uh, even before Israelites arrived in Canaan, even before Israelites ca captured Canaan, even, if, even before Joshua settled his people at Canaan, even much before that, the Canaanites who were living there were speaking Hebrew, were speaking Hebrew. In fact, you know, uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, actually, they are, they are grouped under... Uh, Semitic languages, that is the language that came from Noah's son, Shem. They are classified under the groups of Semitic languages. I'm not, I'm not going very deep into that uh, because we have a very limited time. So I'm just going to give us, give us an overview, but you can always uh, study in depth in regards to all this. So number one, it was the language of Canaanites even before Israelites arrived. And when Israelites arrived and when they stayed there, when they settled there, they started speaking uh, the same languages. It has 22 consonants from left to right, V from right to left, we write from left to right, but uh, when they write Hebrew, it is written from uh, right to left. It has 22 alphabets. English has 26 alphabets. Hebrew has uh, 22 uh, alphabets, and all those 22 alphabets are consonants. So if you want to know what are the 22 alphabets, when you read Psalms 119, when you read Psalms 119, the 176 verses are divided into eight parts. Each part having uh, eight is divided into 22 parts, with each part having eight verses. Having eight verses, and if you see, every each part begins with a Hebrew alphabet. For example, uh, the one to eight verses begins with the alphabet Aleph. You know, you can you can see it both in your regional language Bible or English Bible. Next, you will see Beta. Uh, Gimel, Dalat, He, Wav, Zayin, Shetet. So this is something that we can see. Uh, these are the 22 alphabets of Hebrew uh, language. These are the 22 alphabets of the uh, Hebrew language. This Hebrew language can be divided into uh, two basic periods. Two basic periods. One, it is a pre-exilic period. That is, that was before uh, Israelites went into Babylonian exile. So Hebrew language is basically divided into two periods. One is pre-exilic period, another one is the post-exilic period. That is when, when Cyrus came and, uh, and and gave them an option even to go back to their homeland. That that, that period of Hebrew is called as the post-exilic uh, post period. So this pre-exilic period is actually called as the golden age of Hebrew uh, because that was the time the Hebrew really uh, had its real value. That is the time when really uh, people uh, people spoke uh, the right kind of Hebrew, but the post-exilic period, they, when they when they were captured, when they went into exile, uh, they lost the words. They, they were mixed with many people groups. They, 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 there were many people that they mixed along uh, that they actually lost the originality of Hebrew. So Aramic is actually is actually came from Syria. It is an Assyrian language. And uh, the post-exilic Hebrew lost the originality of it uh, because of the influence of Aramic. So these are the two main periods. Pre-exilic, it was a perfect Hebrew. It was a golden age. And post-exilic, it lost the originality because of the influence of uh, Aramaic. Now let us look into the uh, Aramaic language because that is the second language in which uh, the Bible was written, the scriptures were written. Aramaic period. Uh, though Hebrew remained as a sacred tongue of Jews, Aramaic was used in vernacular for everyday conversation. 
you know, uh, for example, we have uh, our, we have a slang in which other, we have two different slangs or many different slangs. In a church, we use one particular slang. And when you come back to our homes, our slang is different. Uh, just like that, Hebrew remained as a sacred tongue of Jews. When they read Torah, it was, it was in a perfect Hebrew. But, but when they spoke, when, you, when they spoke at homes, when they spoke in the streets, it was Aramaic. It was Aramaic. Uh, this Aramaic actually had its origin in the Assyrian kingdom. And uh, the alphabets were the same. It, was, it also belonged to the category of Semitic languages. Uh, but the way they spoke uh, but, and the way they wrote the alphabet was different. If you can see this... Uh, uh, this slide, if you can see this tabular column, you will understand, you know, even Aramaic had the same 22 alphabets, but the way they wrote these alphabets was a little bit different, was a little bit different. Uh, otherwise, both uh, the languages were the same. The slang was a bit different, and the way they wrote uh, was different. Okay, this is very, very important. If you, have, if you ever have an op opportunity to study Hebrew and Greek, please do it. Okay, now this is, uh, Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew, but few parts were written in Aramaic. Uh, Old Testament mostly in Hebrew and a few parts were in Aramaic. That is, uh, the periods of uh, Esther, Esra, Nehemiah, they, their books had the Aramaic influence. Their books had the Aramaic. Similarly, some portions of Jeremiah also, they had the influence of Aramaic. Otherwise, the entire of Old Testament was in Hebrew. Similarly, the New Testament was mostly in Greek, except for few parts during the life of Jesus. When we when we look at the four Gospels, few parts of uh, the ministry of Jesus have, was written in Aramaic. Otherwise, mostly uh, it was written in Greek. So it was almost like Aramaic was sandwiched between Hebrew and uh, Greek. So these were some of the uh, minor portions of the Old Testament which were penned in Aramaic. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to share this uh, PowerPoint with everybody, so uh, you really need not bother about writing it. So very minor portions of OT were, were penned in Aramaic. Similarly, even the New Testament had some minor portions written in Aramaic. For example, Talitagumi uh, was a transliteration of, of an Aramaic word, Talitagumi. And similarly, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Shabakthani, what Jesus said was in Aramaic. And uh, what uh, what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 22 was not actually Sabakthani. We read it in English. My Lord, my Lord, why, why have you forsaken me? But when we see that Psalm 22 is actually, it is in the right Hebrew term, which says Asabthani. But when it comes to what Jesus is saying, it, it is Sabakthani. And the difference is this. When you say Asabthani, it is men forsaking me. But when you use the word Sabakthani, it is like God and man are forsaken me. It is total abandonment. I am completely forsaken. And there is no hope for me at all. Uh, similarly, when, when Paul writes, uh, God has poured in our hearts the spirit to call him Abba, Father. That Abba is an Aramaic word. Uh, again, in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, when we read the word Maranatha, again, that is an Aramaic word. So, so, so there are very, very few Aramaic transliterated expressions even in the New Testament, just like how it is in the uh, Old Testament. So this is, again, I've just given you an overview of Aramaic and Hebrew. Now let's go into Greek. I'm not going to dwell much time in Greek because at the end of this, uh, uh, end of this PowerPoint, again, we will be, uh, we'll be studying, uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking a few areas into Greek. First of all, this was called as the Koine Greek. As you all know, this was a language that was introduced by Alexander the Great, and it was Koine Greek. And uh, this was considered to be the best form of Greek, best form of Greek, uh, because um, everybody liked that Greek, because that particular, this particular language had a lot of culture in it. This particular language had a lot of poetry in it, that everybody liked uh, Greek to such an extent that it became the street language of Rome and also the state language of Rome. That means in the court, in the king's palace, everybody had to use, had to speak in Greek. And there is a very beautiful story which is said like this. When Augustus Caesar captured the final parts of the Greek kingdom, he sent a message to his court. He sent a message. He said, we captured and we have destroyed Greek. 
he sent Greece kingdom, he sent that message in the Greek language. It was to that extent that they loved Greek and they didn't change it with an other language because all the other nations, when they went in, they, they brought their own languages. For example, when, uh, when Assyria captured Israel, they, they brought in Arami. When Babylonians captured, they brought in Babylonian language. When Persians ca captured, they brought their own language. But when Romans captured Greek, they set in with that same language because it was, of, it was, it was so beautiful. Uh, it was so poetic feel. It had a lot of culture in it. And uh, even during Jesus' time, uh, Greek was spoken because that was the time when Romans were ruling. And even in the life of Jesus, uh, some, some, uh, some Greeks came and, uh, came and spoke with them. Okay, anyway, uh, we will look, look about Greek in detail uh, maybe sometime later. So, uh, if you look into your screens, you can see this is the comparison of these three languages. Uh, we might not appreciate it unless and until we know these languages. Uh, but, it, but it actually shows the, the difference between uh, these three languages. So, so now we have almost completed uh, the part one. So three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and, and uh, Greek. Now let us go into the uh, part number two. As I told you, there are four parts. Part number two. This is just going to be something that we all know very well. But again, because when we are looking at how we got the Bible, we, we also need to understand the pain that they had to go through in writing it. So we're just going to look at the writing materials of the Bible, the writing materials of the Bible. So the Bible was written in various forms. And today we have a uh, digital format. You know, we, we read our Bible through apps and uh, we read our Bible through some software. So, uh, but how did the Bible actually start? The Bible actually started by, by, by it was first written on stone. Think of writing Moses writing at Mount Sinai, writing at top of the hill on a stone using chisel and hammer. It is not a joke. You know, the chisel could break, the hammer could slip, or the stone could break. It was a tough job. But that was how the Bible was first started to be written. First, it was written on stone. Secondly, it was it got an upgrade. It got an upgrade. It was written on plastered stone. It was written on plastered stone. If you read uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27, verses 2 and 3, there we can give, we can see, you know, God uh, advising Moses to write and coat them with plaster. Set up stones and coat them with plaster and write on them. You know, stone was tough. Then it became a plastered stone. Then they also wrote on clay. They also wrote on clay, just like how, uh, just uh, how our kids play with clay and write on them. And uh, they wrote on clay. When you read Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 1, I think uh, in KJV version alone, it says, Son of man, take a block of clay and uh, draw the city of Jerusalem that is in front of you. So then they wrote on clay. Then they wrote on wooden tablets. Uh, the, the census that David took, now we read about the census that David took, which God abode. That census of David is actually found in a tablet of uh, wood. It is there. And similarly, the accounts of Solomon's temple, when Solomon built a temple, the accounts are, uh, are discovered today by archaeologists from uh, these wooden tablets. Wooden tablets. Similarly, uh, they wrote on wax. They wrote. They wrote on wax plates. They set. Uh, they they set a wooden frame around it, and they kept a plate of wax in it, and they they wrote on it. And even these wax plates were given as medals to people who did good deeds. So, so they wrote on wax, and then they wrote on metals. Uh, this particular thing, if you can see me where I am showing the cursor, uh, you can see these few things. These. Uh, metals, these are all bronze uh, metals, which were given to soldiers as diplomas for achieving something at war. When a soldier uh, does something big at war, he is given a diploma, which is a great honor, which is a great honor, which he will cherish for generations. So they wrote on metals. Uh, when you read Exodus chapter 28 and verse 36, uh, God says, Moses, take a, take a medallion of pure gold and seal the words holy to the Lord. So they wrote on it. And uh, another amazing thing that they wrote, they, they wrote on was portraits. Portraits, they wrote on pots. And uh, this, when you when you see this particular picture where I'm showing the cursor, when a pot is broken, these little, little uh, pieces, such one piece is called as ostracon. 
such one piece is called as ostrogon these pieces are given were were given as bills were given as bills during those days today just like how we have, we have paper bills digital bills they used to give bills and ostrogon and one amazing find was this the 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 almost half of the reign of king david are found in these ostrogons and i'm just wondering why were they written down in ostrogons half of the reign of king david are actually found in these uh, ostrogon um, which is really amazing and then they wrote on leather finally they they started uh, writing on writing in leather and we know this amazing verse that uh, apostle paul at the end of his life wrote to timothy in second timothy chapter 4 and 13 when he wrote to me said when you come uh, bring my cloak and also uh, and and especially the parchments and especially the parchments so that was this was taken from calf skin or goat skin or sheep skin and they were made into it so they were written on uh, leather scrolls and finally with the invention of paper uh paper came up all the other had some problem you know either the chisel will break or the stone will break tough to carry and everything and uh, finally paper came about and almost by, by the end of revelation by the end of revelation at the, at the end of the bible you know this paper came you know that is why when uh, when apostle john when he wrote to uh, when he wrote to a church in second john there is just one chapter second john and verse 12 uh, he, he 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 says these words you know Uh, i have much to write to you but i do not want to use paper and ink maybe uh, he wanted to meet them personally or maybe you know paper and ink just because they were invented at that time and maybe they were very costly but whatever but whatever uh, finally paper came up and then recycled paper came up and now we have uh, then softwares came up and now we have apps so uh, this was how the bible came up and uh, many times you know we don't really understand the value of the bible but you know i remember this one one instant that i will never forget in my life i used to live in vellur and once i got on a cart party station i took a shar auto from cart party to to cmc hospital while i was going there while i was going in that shar auto uh, i was i was sitting behind and uh, if you see this those shar autos in vellur uh, they even sit will sit next to the driver uh, next to the person who is driving that auto the, uh, the, the, there was this one uh, one one kavi kavi color dressed samyar who got into it with a cloth uh, with a cloth bag and he kept it near the uh, auto driver's feet the moment he kept it uh, the auto driver asked the uh, asked this man is bhagavad gita inside it and he said yes and the next moment that uh, the auto driver uh, told this uh, this kavi dressed man he said this you know it is sadharana bible kadiyade this is bhagavad gita he said this is not an ordinary bible this is an extreme bhagavad gita and this auto driver stopped the auto took the cloth bag and kept it on his lap and started driving and that was the time i thought you know how many how many of us bible the first page is torn the last page is torn or some pages are missing uh so you know, that is that is that is very sad that is not the right way but for us to get this bible uh, when you when you look into part 2 we can see people like uh, wickliff people like tindale they were uh, people like uh, martin luther people were tortured people were killed people were excommunicated you know it was horrible we will look at in part 2 but now for this to get us this was a tough writing materials that they had to go through and every time you hold a bible in your hand remember it was not easy today it might be easy you can spend 1000 bucks and get a very good bible but it was not that easy for those who were writing it down okay now let's move on to part Three, part three. We look into part three, and um, the part one and part two were quite easy. But this, I really want your utmost attention, so that you you will understand even this, and you will appreciate the beauty of our Bible, the beauty of our Bible. So let's look into part three. We are going to look at manuscripts, manuscripts. So this might be a new term for some of us. What is a manuscript? We are going to look at well, the Old Testament manuscripts. New Testament manuscripts are entirely different. which we will look at some other time but today we are going to look at what is a manuscript and what are the what are the old testament manuscripts that they have and how these manuscripts helped in shaping up of the bible so what is a manuscript a manuscript is a handwritten portion of a text of the bible so those days they didn't have printers only it was in the 15th century when john and gutenberg invented the printer uh, the tyndale's bible was the first one to be printed in a printer before before that even people like john wickliff all they, they had to write bible they had to hand write the bible into into thousands of copies 
So even much before that, we are talking about uh, in the in in BC during those times, they didn't even have the the paper and ink that they that even Wycliffe had. If they had to write it maybe in scrolls, maybe in different things uh, on all the writing materials that we saw. So a biblical manuscript is a handwritten copy of a portion of the Bible, and the original copy is called as the autographer. For example, if you take uh, if you take Prophet Jeremiah, what he wrote, what he wrote by himself, or if you take uh, Prophet Ezekiel, what he wrote is the autograph. Now, over a period of time, the, the, his one copy is not enough for many generations. Even our own books that we have, you know, over a period of time, they become old. Sometimes, you know, paper loose, loose, uh, gets, uh, loses its worth. Similarly, so before... The original copy of Jeremiah or Ezekiel, before it gets lost or before it gets destroyed, there were scribes who took copies of it. For example, for Jeremiah, there was Baruch who took many copies of it. So similarly, so a manuscript is a copy and an autographer is the original, is the original. And this is very, very important. We need to, this manuscript is very, very important because today no book ever that was written 500 years earlier has the original autograph. Let me tell you again, no book, no religious book, no secular book, no no book has the original autograph. Every, every, every copy that we have is a manuscript, is a copy, and it is not the original because the original has been destroyed over time. That is not just for the Bible, but that is the same for Quran. That is the same. That is the same for a book of Shakespeare, or that is the same for everything. Everything. Uh, we look at. We look at the. We look at some of the manuscripts books that were written during the period when Old Testament were written. There were other books like Homer, Herodotus, Caesar. They also wrote some books. For example, Homer. He wrote a book called Iliad. So the available copies that we have right now is just 643. Herodotus wrote a book called History. And the available copies are just eight. Caesar, he wrote about Gallic Wars. And the available copies are just ten. But when you come to the New Testament, there are 5,686 manuscripts that are available even today. And taking all the little bit of manuscripts, torn manuscripts, codices, minuscules, you know, there are many terms which might be, we might look at the new, when, when we study the New Testament. Overall, New Testament has... 24,970 manuscripts, which is amazing, which is a huge number. Similarly, Old Testament, the scrolls and codices together range to more than 42,000 copies. So that was the way how God preserved it. That is the way how people gave up their lives to preserve it. So all together, all together, combining the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible has more than 66,000 manuscripts. 66,000 manuscripts, which is nowhere near to any other book, whether it is religion or secular. You know, that is one amazing thing by which we can rely, we can say firmly that the Bible is reliable, that the Bible is reliable. You know, more than 3,500 years since the Bible was uh, was started to be started to be written, but still there are more than 66,000 manuscripts and scrolls that are still available. Another important factor is something uh, okay let me just let me just show you this one slide so this is how this is how this autographer and manuscript work so uh, let us say this picture this is the autographer so this autographer was written by the original author this c stands for copy c stands for copy so there was one scribe who wrote a copy called a c11 i'm just giving them some random names so c11 was one scribe who took a copy c12 took a copy c13 took a copy now over a period of time the C11, C12, C13 also will become more. Even they will get destroyed. So what will happen is the C11's copy will be will be copied by another scribe for whom I have given a number C111. Similarly, he C112 took another copy. And this is how copies were taken down the generations. This autographa would have been lost. Might be even the first generation manuscript would have been lost. But... The other copies which were taken down are theirs with us. And uh, now you will appreciate. So if you can understand this, the next slide will make more sense. So this is the autographer. So this is the manuscript, the first manuscript. And from C11 came the second manuscript. And similarly from C12 came uh, C1122 as the 
third generation manuscript now this is very very important the time gap between each manuscript is very very important the time gap between each manuscript is very important for example the time gap between autograph autographa and c12 what is the time gap uh, what is the time gap between c11 and c111 that is very very important what is the time gap between c112 and uh, c1122 what is the time gap this time gap is very very important otherwise i can say this the you know for example if i'm going to say autographa is here uh, earliest manuscript is here and today our versions are here and if i say mark this as x that is the the time uh, time the time gap between autographa and the earliest manuscript shorter the x the shorter the x the more reliable the manuscript is because if this x is going to be longer if this green line is going to be somewhere here then the time gap between the autographa and the manuscript will be longer so in this gap more additions might come more deletions might come more additions may come and it might lose the original message so shorter the x so remember this shorter the x uh, the more reliable the manuscript is now let us just look uh, what is the x for the bible and what is the x for the uh, for the other books for the other books again i'm just going to compare uh, with these books for example iliad you know the the original autographa was written around 800 bc the earliest copy that is present right now is 400 bc the time gap is 400 years similarly the herodotus history the time gap is around uh, 1350 years caesar gallicus the time gap is around 1000 years now come to the new testament you know, the new testament was was written uh, between 50 ad and 100 ad so the time gap we have 114 fragments in a time gap of 50 years think of 50 years and 400 years think of 200 we have 200 fragments in a gap of 100 years and almost by 225 years in the time gap of 225 years we have got the entire bible we got the entire bible but that is that means by uh, if the bible was completed around 100 ad by 300 ad by 325 ad the entire bible was compiled that means the time gap between the autographa and the manuscript is just 225 just 200 years for the entire bible to be developed that is no way uh, close to any other book in the bible even the other religious book i'm not mentioning them because that's not our area of interest so lesser the time gap the uh, the more reliable the manuscript is and this gives us another proof that uh, how much these manuscripts can be reliable so this is the different this is the, this is the shorter x that we have when we look into our bible now uh, available ot manuscripts now i told you there are around 42000 old testament manuscripts as you know 42000 are not uh, you cannot even study them even uh, you cannot take even an entire lifetime to study it but you know there are there are there are some very famous one like abishai scroll dead sea scroll uh cairo fragments cairo codex lenengard codex alepo codex samaritan pentateuch you know even even these uh, eight or nine you know we cannot we cannot uh, we cannot study it just like this i'm just going to look into uh, four major manuscripts i'm just going to touch on four major manuscripts one is samaritan pentateuch another one is its opposite masoretic text another one is dead sea scrolls another one is septuagint so these are the four manuscripts that we will look today Uh, even before we close so now uh, what is samaritan pentateuch you know when israel and judah got separated uh, the king of israel uh, feared that people will go to jerusalem to to worship god there so he created their the, the uh, samaria he created israelites own worship center in samaria similarly when torah was the scripture of judah israel developed their own torah they developed their own torah and that was called as the samaritan torah or samaritan pentateuch so samaritan torah or samaritan pentateuch also has the five books of torah genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy even they have the same five books that uh, judah has that we all have that same thing 
this was written in a samaritan alphabet they had their own alphabet uh, they didn't they, they didn't uh, they didn't write they didn't write with hebrew they had their they wrote in their own alphabet and this was the uh, scripture book of the samaritan this was a scripture book of samaritan but sadly this is not at all a good guide this is not at all a good guide because there are around 6000 differences between uh, samaritan torah and the hebrew torah there are around 6000 differences and why did these 6000 differences came up they made deliberate alterations and adaptations to support their own ways of worshiping the god you know just like how uh, even today people use the word of god for their own ways you know in tamil there is there is a word which says you know where that they purattikiravargal you know they they today even today there are people who use bible for their own way similarly it, it didn't start in the 19th or 20th century so that long way back even during samaritan's time where they made deliberate alterations to the law and uh, so that you know they can worship god in their own style they can serve god in their uh, in their own way so this is not at all a good book but you can always study them as a as a historical book but it is not a scriptural book secondly masoretic text masoretic text this is the original hebrew text the opposite of samaritan pentateuch is masoretic text so this is the original uh, original uh, hebrew book the people who worked who worked on this masoretic text are called as masorets the original the people who worked on this masoretic text are called as uh, masorets so this the they this work began only in the 6th century and the reason why they began the began this work is actually amazing by the 5th century uh, islam was on the rise and so uh, we all know all these crusade wars and all this much later which all that happened much later but uh, but almost even in the 5th century 6th century islam was on the rise and they were actually these these, these islamic warriors they used to raid these jewish colonies and uh, destroy their worship material and kill the jews so what happened is these jews they were not scared of their life but they were scared of losing the scriptures so what they did is they said we are going to save our scripture they are going to save our scripture so they started working they started working on these scriptures to preserve them they started copying they started taking uh, thousands of copies so that even if in, in one particular raid they lost 500 copies it is already right. there will be another 500 to sustain them so that was how they worked to preserve the bible when is when, when islam was on the rise and when those armies were were raiding them so this work was began in the 6th century and it was completed by 10th century ma'am remember for 400 years they worked on the bible today the bible that we have was worked with blood for 400 years they preserved the bible for 400 years and finally and uh, no you when when you when you see this see the story of masorets you know we will we, we really have to salute them the way they labored for it and uh, finally what happened to them and uh, they worked in two groups basically you know not all the jews returned back from persia many settled back in babylon so people who worked from babylon uh, those uh, the, those people are called as eastern masorets and the text that they worked was called as eastern masoretic text and those who worked in palestine those who came back and those who worked there that was called as the western uh, masoretic text and today the copies that we have is actually a combination of both and uh, these people when they were right when they were doing this work in the 6th century and to 10th century by that time you know many people even forgot hebrew on the line you know generations they didn't learn hebrew or they forgot hebrew so they were they the, the originality of hebrew was lost so what they did is they tried to restore they tried to restore the originality of hebrew they invented uh, a system called as pointing you know just like you know if you, if you play keyboard or guitar you will know that you know you know in those, in those notes you will find something called as cantillation similarly they introduced a system called pointing where they placed a stress and they where they where they put this you know you can see this particular text where the, there are pointings in red they placed pointings where the stress has to be there so that you know uh, the jews can worship god in a better way they placed cantillation marks they placed they placed pointers so that the stress will be there so that was how they wanted to live the bible they wanted to live the scriptures they do not want it to be just a theoretical book so when masorets worked they worked in such a way that when a man when a, when a jew reads it uh, he will read it with the stress in it for example when a sailor comes 
he will really pause. He will really pause and worship God at that point. So they labored for it. They introduced. They discovered a system called pointing, and uh, they worked on it. And the earliest manuscript, Masoretic manuscript that we have today, is called as Aleppo Codex. Aleppo Codex. Now we will understand how truthful these uh, Masorets were. You know, when they found out that much of their work had a lot of inaccuracies, because, you know, they were trying to preserve it to before a war comes. So they were trying to do it quickly. You know, these Masorets, you know, they were, uh, before writing, they used to go take bath, before using the word Yahweh or something, you know, they used to go take bath. So that was the kind of respect that they were giving to their work. In spite of all this, they found out many inaccuracies. They found out many inaccuracies. When they found all these inaccuracies, they said, I am not, we are not going to pass down an inaccurate text to the next generation. And they destroyed and they burnt all their work. So the present copies of Masorets that we have are very limited, very limited. And, you know, that is why, you know, sometimes you see footnotes under the Bible, which is not present in one manuscript, which is present in the other manuscript. And uh, many people take that and abuse, abuse, saying this version is right, that version is wrong, wrong. But I always feel, you know, every version is the word of God and everything has the capacity to save a person and to transform a person. You know, they, their errors were simple spelling mistakes or the way they trans, where, where, where they position the alphabets and all that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, uh, what, what were the errors, but um, you can actually do a deep, deep study. You know, they were all simple uh, simple, small, small errors, you know, they missed the alphabet, they missed a the word, or the, there was a spelling mistake, so, and uh, all that. Now we'll go on to the third manuscript, that is the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, they were found near the Dead Sea. It was found in the very year that India got independence in 1947. They were found by shepherds. They were found by uh, two shepherd boys. You know, these were the two guys, now they are old. But when they were, when they were two small boys, when they were taking care of the sheep, uh, the few sheep, you know, it, they ran off and uh, they, 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 they went into a cave, um, cave where they, were, where they were tending the sheep. So when these, when these guys went in to take the sheep, uh, another one of, one of the boys threw a stone into the cave. When they threw a stone into the cave, they heard the sound of a pot break, uh, breaking. And when they, when they went in to see what happened, uh, they found... Uh, lots of scrolls inside there. They did not know the value of it. So they took all those scrolls, whatever they found, and they sold it into a second-hand market. And this person who, who bought it in the second-hand market, he also did not know what it is. So he went and sold it to another person. And finally, when it, when it, when it fell in the hand of a learned man, that was the, when they traced back to the shepherd boys where they found it, where they got it, and an entire research started. So the research started uh, in 1946, and it went on till 1956, and they found around 25,000 different manuscripts and scrolls, and they almost got the entire Bible in different, they found almost 11 caves, 11 caves, and uh, they got the entire Bible, and uh, most of the scrolls were cut off, you know, over because of the period of time. Uh, many scrolls were broken, many scrolls were torn, but the book of Isaiah was was, was discovered as one single scroll. So that was an amazing song. So, so this is the uh, map of Israel, as we all know. So this is the Dead, uh, uh, Dead Sea, and uh, this particular yellow arrow, which is showing, this is where the scrolls were found, and that particular place is called as Qumran. Qumran, that is why Sometimes these are called, these are even called as Qumran scrolls, Qumran scrolls. And you know who preserved all the all of these scrolls? It was these Masorets. You know, this was one of these cave one inside this cave, and uh, it, they were preserved preserved in these clay jars. So they were preserved in these low, big jars. You know, you Masorets preserved these scrolls, preserved these scrolls. You know, so that you know it will be preserved even for generations and even after uh, 20 centuries. Uh, or maybe 15 to 16 centuries, uh, we could we could still have it. We could still uh, have it. So not just biblical scrolls were found. Even some non-biblical scrolls were found in Qumran. Even some non-biblical scrolls were were were, uh, were found in Qumran. For example, they found some scrolls called as uh, Pesharim. Pesharim or nothing but interpretation of the Bible. Just like today, how we have commentaries. Uh, 
uh, how, how your Bible study aids, you know, those, those, uh, the Old Testament had a lot of theological uh, interpretations, you know, uh, there, was a, there was something called as Midrasha, which is oral commentary on the written law. You know, there were, there were a group of people, not everybody can take the, take the scroll in the synagogue and read. You know, it was read by a group of people that was called as uh, Taniyatim. Taniyatim is the group of, uh, group of Pharisees who are allowed to read the Bible. So when he reads the scriptures, he gives a commentary on what is written there. So uh, this oral commentary was actually written down much later, uh, which was called as Midrasha. Whatever he said was, uh, was just copied. And this Midrasha uh, was again recopied into Mishnah. With, with, with some extra additions, with, 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 a, with, with a better interpretations and Talmud. Uh, we, have, we would have heard the word Talmud. So this was a commentary of Krishna. So it was not just one commentary. They got all these different commentaries. They got so much of commentary, uh, not just the uh, scriptural material, not just the uh, uh, scriptures of the law and the prophets, but even commentaries. You know, that shows us, you know, how they viewed the Bible. How they saw the Bible that was amazing, and then and then they even had something called as uh, Hagada, that is teaching God's ways by using stories. You know, parables. We know parables only when Jesus, uh, only 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 when the ministry of Jesus uh, began. But they they were there even much before, even in the Old Testament. You know, they teach God's ways by the use of stories. You know, maybe Jesus adapted that material, seeing these Old Testament uh, Old Testament ways. Uh, Halakha. Teaching regarding rules, precepts, and laws. They teach rules, you know, they say how to live, how to worship God. So all these, all these extra commentaries uh, are also available, which again, again shows how scripture can be relied. They not, we, we not just got the scriptures, but even the support aid, which support study aids, which support the scripture. So this is, these are the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can look much deeper in it because Dead Sea Scrolls is a very big subject. There were 11 caves, and I think it was in cave number 11 where they got the entire Solomon's Temple, how it was constructed. Finally, Septuagint. Septuagint. Uh, Septuagint, as we all know, it is a Hebrew Bible in Greek language. Hebrew Bible in Greek language. Uh, Septuagint means 70. It is also called as LXX, LXX because of the 70. So this is a very beautiful story. It was 72 translators. It got the word 70 or LXX or uh, Septuagint because 72, trans 72 translators in 72 days translated the entire Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. You know, this happened around 250 BC uh, where uh, Jews were settled down in Alexandria. They either they did not uh, learn Hebrew or they were born in generations where their parents never taught Hebrew. So these guys, they did not, they did not have the Hebrew Torah. So at, the, at that time, there was the emperor was called Ptolemy II. And there was one man by the name Demetrius, who was the director of the Alexandrian library. So he had a great desire to learn the, uh, to learn the law and the prophets. So what he did is he went to Ptolemy II and he got the permission to translate it. So they took an island. It was, it was almost like a resort, you know, they took an island where no one else was there. Uh, so he took 72 translators, he boarded them in a, in, in a ship uh, and he took them to this island. The island name is Island of Pharos. So he took them to this island of Pharos where all the 72 translators worked. And as they say, the Demetrius himself wrote down the translated text. One man wrote down the entire translated text. And all this is found in the historical book called as Letter of Aristius. Aristius. So it was amazing uh, how they did it. So this, because of this, it was accessible to many non-Jews, and this became the holy book of the early Christian church. This was the holy book of the early Christian church. This was translated by the Jews, and the moment the translator translation was done, everybody started reading Septuagint then. That the, than the Hebrew Torah. They stopped the, stopped reading it in Hebrew and everybody came to Greek because at that time the fashion was reading it in Greek. So everybody jumped into Greek and uh, Hebrew uh, started losing its value. And these Jews, they, they were embarrassed, they regretted and they said, uh, we regret for translating it into Greek. But uh, this was the turning point of the Bible because from Hebrew, 
it later got translated into latin by father saint jerome and from latin it spread to all the other languages from latin it went to german from latin it came to english it came to all the but jews completely disowned it uh, saying that our hebrew is important not your greek so though they made it they regretted for making it and they disowned it so this septuagint was almost the starting point of the uh, formation of the old testament so this septuagint had 39 books of the old testament and the 14 books of the apocrypha we will not be looking into the apocrypha today we will be looking at it in the next time so this was how these 39 books took shape and uh, and this is where now 39 plus 14 are there so that means uh, almost there are 53 books so now canonization begin so all 53 will not, cannot be recognized as god inspired So this is where canonization begins, and this is where we have come to uh, part four. Canonization is nothing but a uh, standard of measurement. You use um, you you uh, that that is a measurement that to to you use to decide whether this this should be accepted as God inspired one or not. So it's it is it's nothing but just a scale or or a grade that you give whether this can come in or whether this this should not uh, come in. A Bible, a biblical canon. means it has been considered authoritative as a uh, as a scripture you know uh, these canonical books were developed through debate and agreement for example the book of esther was one of the books that were debated much because it did not have the word god in it it did not have the word god in it so it was um, it was it was debated whether it should come in. it was debated by the uh, by the by the early scholars you know these it was, it was those jews who actually debated it uh, so they all but at the end of it when they found that it was inspired by god they let it in so how was the canon uh, determined how was the canon determined how was the canon determined they used five principles i'm going to close with these five principles what are the five principles you know they were i uh, they, they are also called as the fingerprints of god so the early church elders the early church leaders the early church fathers they said if a book fulfills these five points they can be considered as a scripture inspired by god or else it is it cannot or it or else it will be considered as an apocryphal book in tamil we call it as thallagu mangal you know it cannot come into the bible it is it is outside so what are the five fingerprints what are the five fingerprints number one was it written by a prophet of god the first point that they saw is was it written by a prophet of god or a man of god number two was it confirmed by the acts of god I mean, were there miracles involved? Were there miracles involved in that book? Was it confirmed by the acts of God? And this was one point through which Esther could come in. Did it have the God working miracles in that book? Number three, did he tell truth about God? Was was telling the truth consistent in that book? There are some books, even in the Apocrypha, where uh, they told the truth of truth about God, but they were not consistent in telling the truth. so the third point is did they tell truth about god did they tell were they consistent in telling the truth about god number four did it have the power of god in other words did it have the did it have god's power to transform lives did it have god's power to transform lives did it have the power of god and finally was it accepted by god was it accepted by god sorry was it accepted by the people of god finally uh, though they debated at the end of the, at the end of the day everybody had to agree to it agree to it was it accepted by the people of god so these are the five points number one was it written by a prophet of god was it confirmed by the acts of god uh, were they consistent in telling the truth did it have the power of god was it accepted by the people of god by, by almost uh, 350 bc the entire ot canon was ready by 350 bc the entire ot canon was ready you know today uh, our old testament we have 39 books but a jewish old testament they have the same 39 books in 24 book format a jewish hebrew bible a jewish hebrew bible a jewish bible uh, has only 24 books they have only 24 books and uh, how are they classified so this is going to be the last slide uh, how are they classified they are mainly uh, divided into three into into three different variants number one it is torah or teaching torah or teaching so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So these five come under Torah or teaching. We call it as the book of books of the law. 
uh, and then comes prophetic books prophetic books uh, or nevim so they classified prophetic books as earlier prophets and later prophets we call the major prophets minor prophets according to the number of pages but they called as earlier prophets and later prophets so in earlier prophets joshua judges we have first samuel second samuel first kings and second kings but they don't have two samuels they have only one samuel they have brought both the samuels together as one book so for them the earlier prophets were joshua judges samuel and kings and the later prophets were isaiah jeremiah ezekiel and the 12 so all the 12 minor prophets are brought together as one book uh, starting from hosea to malachi all the 12 prophets are brought into one book so they are they are considered as the later prophets and uh, and uh, finally they have something called as writings or ketuvim writings of ketuvim so this ketuvim is classified into three parts one is poetry psalms proverbs and job they come under poetry and uh, and another second part is megillot or they called it as five roads Uh, five books song of songs ruth lamentations ecclesiastes and esther and for a jew reading these five books in a single read uh, reading these five books in a single shot is considered as an act of worship so they are they when they start with song of songs they will make sure they finish with esther for them it is an act of worship they do it and finally the historical books daniel esther and nehemiah as one book and chronicles 1 and 2 as one book so this is the hebrew jewish bible this is the jewish canon and this book is very very important because this was the book with which jesus was trained you know we we see this is the age of 12 sitting with the big elders how did he which was these was this book that he was getting trained in you know this was the scripture of the early church you know it was an apostle paul went on missionary journeys when he carried a bible it was these it was this book that he carried and it was the scripture of the early church it was it was, it was this book uh, this this bible was uh, was the foundation on which the early apostles started their ministry so this is uh, a very important book and this is the turning point of how we got the bible so i stop here i stop here uh, we are we are at 8:30 so i stop here almost we crossed 8:30 so i stop here so we will look and look look uh, further into it at some point but let me tell you it uh, people worked hard and it was an amazing way that they went uh, to give us the bible and it is not something to be abused so shall, shall you all just pray if you have any question you can always give to the host and we can give it back to you later we are loving heavenly father i thank you lord for this wonderful time that you gave us thank you lord for this wonderful words of life oh father god your word is a lamp unto our feet a light to our paths it is a life to our bones it is a life to our soul father god we saw the pain that they had to go through in giving it lord we praise god for every single scribe who worked hard and uh, even when we have this bible in our hands lord help us to hold that with the respect with the fear of the of the pain that they went through and how you will judge and how you will reward every person the way they use it father lord even as we listen today lord i pray that you will give us you will give us a spirit a desire to meditate your word more not just as a tradition not just for name sake but reading it with real desire with real passion to know more about you lord be with everybody who has listened to these words lord that the desire in them grow more and let them appreciate the work of the 66 books of the bible more we thank you for all that you are doing to, to us thank you for your for the way that you are giving us hope and encouragement we surrender ourselves completely at your feet in jesus name we pray amen